Happy Easter. It is wonderful to be here to celebrate. Uh, we've been working our way to this moment for all of Lent, and especially this past Holy Week, and now we celebrate that Christ is risen. Oh, I knew you were going to do that. You're practicing. We're going to do that in a second. I have a couple of announcements, just two. Uh, there are other things happening. If you're getting our Bethany emails, watch that. Um, but two important things. Um, as we leave this Easter celebration, we will be gathering on Wednesday night for a family meal at 530. And we also have other Wednesday night activities that are happening, particularly for our kids and youth. Um, we have a joyful noise children's choir they're going to be meeting at five and then after our meal at 6 15 the kids are going to have a story and activity time in the lower level uh, of our building and then our youth at that same time about 6 15 are going to have their normal youth group time so if you are a child or a youth a parent or a grandparent of one or you just know one have them come and join us. We will have a lot of fun um, on Wednesday night, and everyone, of course, is invited for our meal at 6.15, or at, sorry, I just said the wrong time, 5.30, 5.30, 5.30 for the meal. It's going to be a brat fry, so spring must be here, right, Mike? Absolutely. Uh, the other announcement that I want to make is that it is April, and as part of the work that we do here at Bethany, we always select a mission of the month. Our mission this month that we're supporting is the Good News Jail and Prison Ministry. Um, the important thing to let you know is that they are having a fundraising banquet on the 25th of April. And if you, that's a Tuesday, if you would like to attend, Bethany is going to have a group of people that sit together. Uh, you need to let Barb Bonnet know. Barb is sitting in the back. She's going to wave her hand. Okay, or see me and I'll point you in Barb's direction. Uh, she needs to have those numbers by Thursday uh, so that th the Good News Jail and Prison Ministry can plan appropriately for that banquet. All right, that's all the announcements we have for today. And we are here to celebrate. So, you've already practiced this. We're going to do this together. People of God, Christ has risen. He has risen. Christ is risen. He is risen Christ is risen. He is risen Hallelujah. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Would you please stand? And we are going to worship together the risen Lord in song. you 
Everybody, everybody looks so nice today. I really love it. Um, so we are going to join uh, millions of people around the world right now and celebrate that Jesus is risen, that he is the king of heaven. So let's lift up our voices and, uh, and celebrate Jesus this morning. <laughs>
Gracious God, we do come this morning honoring you and celebrating that because of your death and resurrection, we have new life. Lord, we say with churches around the world and the hosts in heaven, alleluia, praise, praise to the risen Christ. We thank you for this great gift of salvation. Amen. Amen. So, I brought my computer up here, not on accident. Um, I want to remind us that every week, including on Easter Sunday, there are between, oh, I don't know, 10 and 30 screens joining us, households joining us online. So I want us to turn around, there's a camera here, and wave a happy Easter to our friends like Deb and Rich and Angie and Joe. Uh, So many people are joining us online. And then turn and greet one another on this Easter morning. One of the gifts, one of the gifts that we have because of Christ's sacrifice for us is that he made a way for us to have relationship with God. And part of that relationship is that we can bring to him our prayers. Um, One of the longest parts of our Bible is the Psalms. And if you read in those Psalms, you will see a variety of prayers from praise and thanksgiving to lament and grief. 
And all of us, although this is a celebratory day, of course, all of us bring a mixed bag, if we're honest. And so together, we will um, bring our prayers to God, both the celebrations and the needs that we have. Would you pray with me? Great God, our Father, we give you thanks today for your love and your grace and your power on this resurrection day. We thank you that we can gather in this place with so many friends and loved ones to worship you. We thank you for the beautiful colors in the flowers in the sanctuary and also the signs of spring outside. All of these remind us of new life. Today, God, we gather to remember and to celebrate. We remember Jesus who healed the sick and raised the dead. Jesus who gathered children to himself and dealt kindly with outcasts and those who are marginalized. Jesus who suffered and died at our hand. Jesus who secured victory for us. We celebrate that death could not hold Jesus in the grave. We celebrate that not even death is able to separate us from your love. We celebrate the new life that we have in Christ Jesus. And we give that in life and in death, we belong to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ whose resurrection we remember today. And on this hopeful and joy-filled Easter morning, in the midst of our celebration and thanksgiving, God, we also know there are those among us who are bewildered or sad. We lift to you those who have lost hope, those who suffer from depression or loneliness or fear. We lift to you places and people in the world where things are not as they ought to be. Places where the poor are ignored or disregarded. Where war never ends. Where children are hungry. Where parents grieve because they cannot provide. Where accidents happen and death abounds senselessly. God, we lift to you those who are held hostage to addiction or chronic illness, things that debilitate us. Loving Father, may your resurrection give life to those who feel lifeless this morning. Might you inspire those who feel like they might just be going through the motions because of sadness or grief or pain. Meet each one in their need. God, we pray that the good news of the resurrection would give hope to those who are in most need of hope. Those who wonder if you are near will be reminded of your great love. God, may the good news of this resurrection give joy to those who feel less than joyful today. Remind each one of us of the joy and hope that you offer as we celebrate this resurrection. God, we know that we are meant to be your people, ones that you call to participate in your work in this place and in this time, that your kingdom of peace and wholeness would fully come. Empower us by your spirit to show others the promise of resurrection to remind everyone we meet that love is stronger than death. We ask all these things in the name of the risen Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who is in heaven,
we also worship with our whole lives, not just this hour in this space. We worship with the ways that we use our gifts and talents, those things that God has gifted us with. We worship with the ways that we use our finances and our time. So there are many ways to give to the work that's happening here through a God's work that's happening through this church here at Bethany. Uh, they are on the screen. Um, there's also a plate at the back. You may have already encountered it. In this time, though, of offering, I want to ask you to hold your hands out in front of you. And I want you to imagine that in your hand is the things that you are offering to God this morning. Whether those are financial offerings or the way that you will spend your time in this coming week, the ways that you will use your gifts and talents to his glory. And let's offer them up to God together. Gracious God, take these gifts, the things that you have gifted us with that we want to use for your good purposes, for your kingdom purposes. Use them in ways that astound us. Use them in ways that promote your goodness and your love for this creation. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ is risen. Just want to make sure you hadn't fallen asleep already. <laughs> As we uh, look to share the Lord's word this morning, I begin by sharing a, a recollection of a story back uh, when I was going uh, to seminary uh, in the Chicago area. I went to Trinity Divinity School in Deerfield on the north side of Chicago and back in the approximately the mid-80s. And in the middle of the seminary campus, uh, approximately midway between the chapel building and the library, uh, was some landscaping in the center of a courtyard with shrubs, etc., things that you would normally expect uh, of a landscaping nature. And one spring day, uh, as students were walking through the middle of campus on their way to different buildings for classes, uh, a a, a nest, a duck, a, a mother duck and her nest were discovered in the midst of some of these low-lying shrubs. So it didn't take long for students across the, the student body to become aware of that. And so uh, on mornings when people would be crisscrossing or afternoons as they're going to different places around campus, uh, students would kind of pause and, and look in just to check to see how mother duck and the, and the, was doing. And uh, didn't disturb the nest, left it alone, respected the space, uh, but were always interested in how mother duck and future ducklings were doing. One morning, however, as we were crisscrossing across campus, uh, discovered that the, what appeared to be the nest uh, had been destroyed. And, of course, the mother duck wasn't there, and, and just everything was smashed. And so that just kind of put a, a damper on students' moods, uh, which certainly made going to some dry Old Testament classes a little harder to bear. Most, no, most classes were not dry and boring, but there were a few. So the afternoon of this particular day, as I was making my way across the center of campus to another uh, building uh, that, that traced along uh, um, a fairly good-sized pond. What do you think I saw? Yes. <laughs> the mother, mother duck and her seven little ducklings paddling with all their lives in a straight line behind mom. And in that instant, that moment of being transformed from what actually happened? Was there a, a disaster? Did something or someone come and destroy the nest? No, it was about life paddling away in the pond. That memory has stuck in my mind, obviously, because I'm able to tell you this story this morning, uh, but it has always served a little bit as a, 
uh, image of Resurrection Day, of death, or what was perceived as death and destruction, transformed uh, into life. That was a great moment. But there is a greater moment, that moment of celebration when someone who has been wondrously healed from a significant disease or a threatening injury, perhaps some who are gathered here either in person or online, has had such a moment in which you faced a health challenge, a big scare, or know someone who has. And by God's grace, in the process of being treated and, and resting, has been healed. So we have a great moment, my little duck story, or a greater moment when someone is wondrously healed from a disease or a tragic injury. But then there's the greatest moment, and it's the greatest moment that is the reason we are gathered together today on this day of the resurrection. When one who has died is raised to life, this would be truly unique and excel all other healings. This is what this day is all about. So, Christ the Lord is risen, humiliated in death, is raised to life. So, repeat these words after me. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think we're getting the point. So imagine that tomb empty. The big stone is rolled off to the side. And the daylight of resurrection morning is shining bright into that tomb. And as it shines brightly into that tomb, which is empty, it is proclaiming the greatest healing. That Christ is healed from death. And that the Lord's resurrection paves the way for your healing from death when that time comes. Jesus did not need to die and rise from the grave for himself. He did so for you and me. So on this day, even as we deal with life struggles and life travails, and we all have them from time to time and in various degrees, those things do not change the reality of this day. The tomb is empty. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He is healed. The Greek word that we, uh, gets translated in, into English as our word salvation carries little nuances of meaning. They all interact. They're not contradictory to each other. But carries the idea of being rescued and certainly of being saved from something, and it includes the idea of being healed, because to be healed is to be saved from something. To be healed is to be rescued from something. And on this day so long ago, Jesus was rescued from death. He was healed from death. He was saved from death, and He paves the way for you and me. So what a day it was. So having said all of that, let's read one of the gospel accounts of this magnificent, unique day from the gospel of Matthew. After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. 
The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. This is the word of the Lord according to Matthew. Thanks be to God. So what a day it was. I can't even begin to imagine what that day was actually like because it was filled with this mixture of both grief because of what had happened in just the previous uh, few days. There was fear. There was uncertainty. There was certainly a lot of confusion. Uh, You see some of that dynamic across the four Gospels. But one example of confusion that I might just highlight here would be Mary Magdalene, because in John's gospel, somehow in all of this, it appears that that Mary gets separated from the other women in all of this moving around, and she is by herself at some point here at the tomb. And she's weeping, and she's crying, and her heart is just breaking with grief. And she peers into the tomb, and she sees an angel, one sitting at the head and one at the the foot of where Jesus was laying. And and one of the angels asks her, why are you weeping? And her response is that they have taken my Lord and I do not know where they have put him. And and in this exchange, she sees Jesus but does not recognize that it is Jesus for whatever reason. She doesn't recognize Jesus as standing there perhaps off to the side. She thinks he's the gardener. And so Jesus asks her, why are you weeping? And she says, if you know where he is, tell me and I will go get him. And in a moment of clarity, Jesus just calls her name Mary. Say with me her name, Mary. And in hearing her name being called, she recognizes that voice. That is not the voice of a gardener. This is the voice of Jesus. And she turns and she greets him, teacher. What a clarifying moment for all of the confusion For all of the emotional ups and downs. And as Jesus simply calls her name, she zeroes in. This is Jesus. (laughs) I don't have to worry about where he's at because he's right here. He's alive. What a day it was. And it begins, and they, as, as all of them across the span of the Gospels, they begin to realize, these followers of Jesus, they begin to understand the significance of what they were witnessing. They had witnessed Jesus healing many people in the course of his ministry. They had witnessed Jesus even raise others from death, such as Lazarus. But this was something far greater. Because Jesus himself was wounded. Jesus himself was killed. Jesus himself died and was discarded. But the wounded healer is now healed. The wounded healer is now healed. What a day it was.
But we can also stand here today and say, what a day it will be. Because today is foundational, but today is not just about that day in which Jesus was raised from death. It's also about another day that's coming because of that day. The greatest healing of Resurrection Day is the first act in a two-part act. We're only halfway through. Today is the down payment, if we might use that terminology, towards the final healing. You do not need to uh, put the, the text back up on the screen, but in the text from Matthew that we read earlier, we read these words, when the angel in that text invites them to come in and look. Come and see the place where he lay. And of course, what they are invited to behold is that where he lay was where he used to be. He's no longer there. Come see the place where he lay. It's as if there was an invitation that went something like this. Come and see the place where death used to rule. Come and see the place where death has always been in charge. Come see the place where death always had the final word. And what do you see? Nothing. What began with the resurrection of Jesus will be concluded when he returns one day to raise up the dead in Christ. And to transform those who are alive and living in Christ. Because Jesus' intent is not to keep his healing to himself. But to share his healing with the beloved of God. I want to invite you to take a Bible. And turn with me to Paul's letter, first letter to the Thessalonians. And if you need some assistance locating that in the church Bibles, that would be page 1683, 1683. In these words, the Apostle Paul is writing to this church so long ago, and his words are meant to be instructive for us these many, many years later. The words that we read from the Apostle Paul are about that other day that's based upon the day that we celebrate today. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, hear these words. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in faith, or in other words, those who have died in Christ, so that you may not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We can anticipate that other day because of the day that we look back and celebrate today. If that day had not happened, there certainly wouldn't be, be this anticipation of another day. The wounded healer is healed, and in his healing, we also will be healed. 
That anchors us when we live in a world filled with all kinds of wounds. Not just physical wounds, not just sickness, but the wounds that we pick up along the way as we go through life, the hurts. The hurts that we encounter when things don't go our way or when someone treats us or speaks ill of us. All of those wounds. And then ultimately, the biggest wounds, of course, being illness and death. But knowing that Jesus has been there, done that, gives us confidence and strength when we face whatever challenges that we face. That the wounded healer will return. And all who have been wounded in Christ will be raised to new life. In a few moments, we will share the Apostles' Creed, a statement, summary statement of the Christian faith that Christians have professed and shared down through the ages of the church. And this creed contains both a reference to Christ's death and His resurrection, but it also will conclude speaking about the belief of our own bodily resurrection. Today, is this the kind of hope behind all the other hopes of your life? Do you live your life with the confidence that you will experience the greatest healing that Jesus has won for you? Do you live believing that Jesus will have the last word even as you live through whatever travails of life may be present right now? And I, my assumption is that some of us are living with some travails, whether it's online or gathered in person. Does the resurrection life of Jesus still pulse inside of you? inside of me when life is hard and when it's difficult because it's meant to. It's meant to give you what you need as you're processing and dealing with the junk of life because he himself experienced it all. If you are living with that hope, The resurrection life has already begun inside of you. That sets you on a firm foundation. One other passage that I want you to turn to, and that's Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3. So if you backtrack to page uh, 1678, just a few verses here. So Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. So once you find it, I'm going to invite you to read along out loud with me. Again, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Let's read together. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's the truth. The greater truth that stands over and above all of the life truths that we're having to live through. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your mind on things above. It doesn't mean become so earthly or heavenly minded that you can't do anything here. It means what is your focus? Even as you're going through the tough stuff of life, set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And when Christ, who is your life, comes, you will appear with him in glory. That's about the other day yet to come. That's act two that we're waiting for. 
but we can only anticipate Act 2 because we're here to reflect on Act 1. But Jesus accomplished, sets the pace for what will yet come. Where is your hope? This morning, if this is not your hope, that hope can begin today. I would hope that you would not let the sun set on this Resurrection Sunday and not know the hope of Christ dwelling up inside of you. So if you're in a point in life in which you sense God nudging you, God calling you, perhaps in a sense, even as Jesus called Mary's name at the garden tomb, but if you sense him calling you, don't let the sun set today without responding to him. And that response is very simple. Lord Jesus, I believe that you came to this earth. I believe you died on a cross for my sin. I believe you rose from the dead for me. And I trust you. And I want to begin living my life with you, even as I have to deal with all this other stuff. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give you all the honor and the praise and glory because you came and you experienced the full weight of life's junk. You carried the full weight of our sin and our brokenness upon yourself. And you went to a cross. You allowed... You allowed your body to be abused. You allowed your blood to pour. But today, you stand as the wounded healer because you've been there and you've done that. And you will be our companion with us until the day that you come and you call our name and that trumpet blasts and we join you forever and ever in the life that is yet to come. We thank you, O oh God, that though dying is a real event in this world, it is no longer king. You are. And so fill us with your hope today and lead us into the tomorrows with confidence because you died and you rose again. In your name we pray and God's people say, Amen. Would you stand with me as we share the words of the Apostles' Creed? And I would trust that when we get to the sections in there that talk about resurrection, yes, say it with a little more oomph. Right? This is not about... Jesus rose from the dead, right? He is risen, right? He is risen indeed. So let's confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty.
People of God, would you put your hands out in some fashion? You look at your hands, there are no nail marks, there are no scars, because Jesus is the one who holds those. And as you go forth from this place today, may you go forth filled with his grace, his mercy, and peace, because he is more than able to handle any and all the scars that you accumulate on the road of life. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And repeat this, the wounded healer is healed. The wounded healer is healed.
let him heal you. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, and God's joyful people say, Amen. Praise, Praise God. God.